Elizabeth, and I am Associate Director uh, at CIRLAC, which is the Center for Research on Latin America and the Caribbean at York University. On behalf of CIRLAC and Women and Gender Studies at the University of Toronto and Caribbean Studies also at the University of Toronto, I want to welcome you all to Liminal Spaces. We're delighted to be hosting the Toronto launch of this book and to be celebrating all of you who had work in it and all of the labor that has gone into making this wonderful project. We begin with the acknowledgement of the fact that we are on indigenous land. Many indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the territories on which York University and the University of Toronto campuses are located. These precede the establishment of our universities. We acknowledge our presence here on the traditional territory of many indigenous nations. We acknowledge that the area known as Takaranto has been caretaken by the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron-Wendat. It is now home to many First Nation, Inuit, and Métis communities. We acknowledge the current tree holders, the Mississaugas of the new of the first of the First Nations. This territory is subject to the dish with one spoon wampum belt covenant, an agreement to stand to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. We acknowledge our responsibility to that agreement. Tonight, we'd also like to acknowledge the indigenous peoples of the Caribbean, the Maroon peoples, as well as the former enslaved and indentured peoples of the Caribbean. We stand on the shoulders of their struggles. Without them, many of us would not be here in this room. We hope that this discussion will allow us to gather the strength and the energy to do the work which is needed for the continued action to support their well being and in defense of the lands and the environments of the region. In a minute, I'm going to hand over to Elisa Trotz to set the stage and introduce the panel. Once the panel has concluded, we'll have a round of questions from Professor Trotz and myself. We'll try to keep it as brief as we can so we have maximum time for audience participation and for your questions. There are a couple of housekeeping items I need to pass on before I hand over. You'll see that you're on mute. You will be on mute until we start the participation component with you at which point we will open the chat. So that's after the panelists have presented and Elisa and I have asked a couple of questions. But please be thinking of what you'd like to ask or the comments you'd like to make in advance. So when the chat is on, you can just jump right in. Thank you, Elisa. Thank you, Honor. Um, um, my sister soldier and welcome everyone on behalf of the University of Toronto Women and Gender Studies and um, the Caribbean Studies program. I'm really excited to welcome you here as a Caribbean person in Toronto and as a Guyanese woman. It's just a, a delight and a privilege and a pleasure to host these remarkable women and thank you Grace for this gift of a volume and and tonight Grace tells me is the last um, event for this book this year so we are going out with a bang right you come to the right city for this in a sense. Um, I just wanted to say a few things about the way in which this book really beautifully captures the centrality of movement and migration. Um, in the mapping of Caribbean experiences and identities. You know, uh, when you think of Caribbean people, we think of a, a sort of unstoppable, incessant restlessness. In another register, the anthropologist Sidney Mintz describes the sensation of moving while standing still. And, and we see that here played out, the way I like to think of that is here played out even in this wonderful collection that remembers those who don't actually physically leave Guyana but continue to be um, touched by this, by this movement. And it's 
all of our um, you know, wonderful respondents tonight, whether it's Suchitra who who's, comes, her ancestors from India, then to Guyana, then to Nova Scotia, then to the US or Serena and Natalie and their story, they talk about moving all over the place. They never stop moving, I think is what they sort of say. Um, but also in their story and in other stories, we see that that movement is never equal, right? It's always sort of fractured by relations of class or gender, sexuality and race. Um, in her intervention, Sandra Brewster says that, you know, her auntie Sharon is excited by the vastness of our family. And she talks about how they're spread out across cities and provinces and countries. We all have, you know, immediate family members living in all parts of the world. Um, not easy to keep up with them. And certainly in pandemic moment, for Caribbean people, we're living with real anxieties and concerns because our family members, in my case, my parents are in two different Caribbean countries, neither of which Canada Post delivers anything to during the pandemic. So this has become a moment of deep anxiety and concern for many of us. Of course, if movement is a Caribbean thing, you know, Guyanese always got to take it to a new level, right? Um, we have the highest out migration rates in the Caribbean among the highest out-migration rates of tertiary skilled people in the entire world, 90% of those with a tertiary level education migrate from Guyana, about 40% of those with a secondary education. Um, and with Dominica, Hello. I think we are the only two countries that have a negative population growth rate. Canada, which is where we are today and which brings this particular remarkable collection of women together, is a central node in this transnational or diasporic network. A recent report on the Guyanese diaspora from about 2016 estimates, if you believe the legal estimates and even the way that people self-identify that it's about 100,000, just under 100,000 people who live in Canada, who in the census in 2016 reported Guyana as their country of birth. So even that is restricted in terms of thinking about people who identify as second or third generation. And the final thing I wanna say before I hand over um, to our wonderful speakers is that, you know, and this is what brings us here tonight, is that women are really central to this story. You know, the Canadian um, part of this story takes us through Caribbean women's visibility, the way in which that was historically prompted by specific kinds of legislative arrangements, such as the domestic worker scheme, what became the Living Care Grip program that delivered um, thousands of Caribbean women, first from Guadeloupe and then from other parts of the Caribbean, primarily to places like Quebec and to Toronto as domestic workers. So uh, the women have always been a central part of that circuit of movement from, from the Caribbean and tonight from Guyana to Canada, and that's what brings us here with our um, guests, all of whom are either in Canada, the first two presenters this evening actually uh, make Canada their home, that's Sandra Brewster and Erica De Freitas. And then we, they will be followed by Serena Hopkinson and Natalie Hopkinson and Suchitra Matai. We didn't want to waste time by reading their wonderful bios. So we're gonna put that into the chat so that you can hear from their, them directly. And then they will be closed out by the um, beautiful editor of this collection, Grace Aniza Ali, after which Honor and I will ask some questions to get the discussion going, and then we'll, we'll open up to, um, to, to audience questions. So, uh, Sandra? Hello, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm going to read uh, three excerpts, three short excerpts from my, my, uh, my paper, um, A Trace, Evidence of Time Past. <laughs> I'm looking straight at it. I'm trying to remember what the name of it is. <laughs> Um, this was uh, part of my thesis project at uh, U Uni University of Toronto, um, and I graduated in 2017. Um, my work was, it focused on the movement of Caribbean people from Guyana to Toronto and a metaphorical approach per se. I used uh, certain imagery and text as metaphor for that movement, as well as the materiality of the work, photo-based gel transfers for the most part, and the movement of um, images from one uh, surface to another surface. So I'm just gonna read um, three excerpts. My head is full of fractured memories formed from the stories told to me. I can vividly share tales of Jeff, the family dog, chasing Uncle Maxie up the side of the house on East Street 
as he attempted to enter through the window past curfew. I remember Aunt Una protecting my mother by beating up school bullies after class then pushing them into the trenches on the side of the road. I can hear Aunt Joy's long piercing scream that traveled throughout the school hall just before the headmistress slapped her with a ruler in the palm of her hand for misbehaving. I can feel the cool breeze by the seawall where young lovers meet to sit and steal kisses. And I remember my grandmother picking fights with my grandfather, then leaving for the country where she would stay with her family for days and return with bundles of food and clothes for all the children. I can feel the danger of cycling over uneven dirt roads. I can see the sunsets of the tropics. I can hear the sounds of small creatures at night. I can taste sapodilla, mango, papaya, aurora. The stories, talking over each other, often loud, standing up with arms outstretched, motioning to demonstrate an experience, performing a scene that occurred over 40 years ago, each trying for the umpteenth time to convince the other that their version of the memory is correct. Each trying to convince us that they are correct. However, I recognize that they were not only attempting to one up each other, they were teaching us about back home. They want us to experience what they experienced by flying us there on the backs of their words. Mom hustled us together, dressed us in comfortable, cool clothing. She made sure the laces of our running shoes were tied tight and our bellies full before heading out. It was the first weekend of August and like every year, we were on our way downtown to celebrate the streets for, in the streets for Caravana. For that entire Saturday afternoon on University Avenue, people filled the width of the street from sidewalk to sidewalk. Loud Calypso and Soka erupted from gargantuan speakers of sound systems heavy on top of glitter laden truck platforms elevated up high. Many of these trucks carried live bands backed up by dancers, followed by a troop of revelers. From above, I'm sure we looked like a colony of a zillion ants bouncing up and down, all heading in the same direction. The colors were intensely vibrant. The feathers from costumes widely swayed back and forth, so high they swept the bellies of the clouds above. People wore masks twisted and contorted into exaggerated expressions and large scale wire sculptures juk juked upwards in rhythm to the sounds of the steel pan. We all moved together, we all moved south. The major streets had their own side movements, up, down, up and down as people entered and, ex and exited the College, Dundas, Osgood and St. Andrew subway stations. If they were not exiting or entering, they were simply looking for a roti or a, or a dish of cook-up on the side streets and corners of the streets, food necessary to keep up one's energy for the jump up that was the parade. At some point in between the greeting of family and friends, the nibbling of a patty and mom hollering at us to follow along, my sister and I would escape into the throngs of people following the bands. Each person was always situated very close to the next person. And while the bodies moved to the music, I felt mine rise, a slow eventual ascent upward. There were times when my feet were not even touching the ground. Amazed, I'd laugh and simply enjoy being carried away. And the last excerpt. We stood along the busy shoreline. After some negotiating, making deals for how much and for how many, we climbed into a small blue and white speedboat. We were about to travel along the Essequibo River. I was, a, I was disobeying my mother. Don't go into that speedboat, she said, waving her finger at me as I headed to Pearson Airport for Georgetown, Guyana with Aunt Joy. My aunt was taking the trip to reunite with a friend and with home. 
Like most of her siblings, she hadn't been back for many years and invited me to join her. After a trip to the Essequibo years ago, my mom returned with stories of feeling unsteady and unsafe in the boat. I understood as we were all tilted back in the tiny vessel, mom probably felt that at any point, at any time, there may be a bump or a sharp unexpected turn that would cause her to topple over into the river. She did not want to consider the possibility of me falling in either. The boat pulsated up and down as it sped along. The window blew past and through us. We hung tight as the rapids grew stronger. The river is immense. At times, it was hard to take in. While teetering and tottering and, strugg and struggling to steady myself, it was so loud that we were yelling at each other in order to be heard over the roar of the engine and the crash of the waves, both at the same pitch. I paired up and allowed my eyes to follow the flock of birds swirling together, forming, forming an elegant S again and again. Eventually, we calmed as the river calmed and finally sat in silence to experience the beauty and quiet of the Essequibo. The color of the water has been described as cafe au lait. The water is stained by the tannins from the leaves that fall from the surrounding trees, the vegetation, rocks, and other naturally occurring elements, sediment that travels from shore to the depths of the river. So much happens below the surface. As we drifted in silence, our guide pointed towards a line in the river. He explained that the line divided two directions of flow. Each flow had a slightly different shade of brown. We traveled along one direction of flow, then crossed over to the other. As we moved from one line to the other, the boat slightly shifted and eventually flowed in the same direction as the water beneath us. Tiny laps of waves hit our sides, then quieted as we fell in line. Like the piranhas swimming alongside, waiting to nibble on my fingertips and the birds flying in tandem above, we all moved from one place to the next place together. Similar to a generation of people from the Caribbean who picked up and moved on to experience another life, an adventure that may have at times felt like a rush through rough waters. Thank you. Hi, good evening. Um, my name is Erica and my chapter um, consists of um, kind of meditations that are between myself, my mother and my grandmother. The first section I'm going to read is on migration. These notes written over the course of three years between November 8th, 1973 and October 15th, 1976 in cursive have crossed borders and exchanged hands. They were written by my grandmother to my mother after she left Guyana. These sentences extracted from several letters have been examined and rearranged by me. What I'm about to read are uh, fragments of letters that my grandmother wrote to my mother. Just a few lines to let you know we are all okay. I am told it is getting very cold. Don't worry, I will keep you posted. Remember you are as near to me as the phone. I hope you get your passport soon. Things are just the same here, with a few more shortages every now and then, but we can get by somehow. I have not heard from you since my last letter. I hope you are well. Just a few lines to let you know both dad and I are still alive. I myself had to see the doctor on Monday before you phoned. Dad wants you to apply to immigration for himself and me. I know this is going to be a surprise, but he has finally decided to make a move. But on Saturday morning, I began to feel faint again, so I decided to see the doctor, and of course, he ordered me to the hospital right away as he suspected I had a slight heart attack. Everything is just as you left it, only for some robberies at a few pawn shops and jewelry shops with masked bandits with guns, cutlasses, and knives. Plenty of rain is still falling, and now we expect to have high tides next week, so everybody is preparing for floods. I dreamt last night of you, and I had a feeling I would have heard from you. 
I'm working on a wedding cake for Saturday. I had it framed and have it on my glass cabinet so that you are looking over everything that goes on in this house. Everything around so that you are looking around, sorry. Everything around this time, as you would know, is centered around Mashwamani, the 10th anniversary of independence. Let me know if you need anything in particular besides pepper sauce, guava cheese, guava jelly, casrip, and thyme. I'm moving from there and I'm going to live on Murray Street out very far from where I am. About your invitation to dad, nothing doing. He says you can come home instead until I hear from you. The next section is on pre-morning. It is what composes the essence of being. Having done it on many occasions, I should have a greater understanding of the differences between being and having been and the never going to be of human being human. It is not an understanding of it all that I have, but an awareness of its insistence, the way it sists and rests and threads itself, the way it needs and punctures and erupts deep within this cavity. Derrida has whispered to me, first about the politics of friendships and then about this. He has said to me that in all friendships, one will be left to mourn the other. We know this, yet we keep it as murmurs in hushed tones and low voices until there is a fissure and it becomes. I don't have to close my eyes to recall this. This that exasperated my fear of the void that lost carves. The rain was sudden. Everything was tinny and heavy and dank. My chest tightened. I could see it. I could see the rain falling with little to no space between each drop and the street flooding. My mother levitated higher and higher on her back, arms and legs choreographed gracefully flailing as the water quickly yet simply swept her away. This time I was certain that it could be this rain that would take her away from me. What I wrestle with is the preparation, the anticipation of the unpredictability and its permanence, all before it happens, before it happens without repetition. It is our names that will survive us. And the final section is on death. The photograph is an odd size, rectangular in shape with curved edges aged. The face of it is faded and all colors look to be muted, bleached. She lays there still, unmoved. When we see people laying with their eyes unflinching like that, with their hands folded like that, we know. Call it to mind. The last time my mother returned, she returned to cicadas warning from trees, to the natural dampness of flesh, to bananas that are as sweet as they are yellow, to pulpy guinnips picked, to tamarind trees, jackfruits, sapodillas, pawpaws, and mirrors covered with lightning strikes, when lightning strikes. The last time my mother returned, I read in the letters and lines that remained straight that she, my grandmother, wasn't feeling well, wasn't feeling right, wasn't feeling like herself. The last time she returned, she believed that her presence wasn't known. I questioned that. An unarticulated distance emerged in a shared space where breaths were taken, held, and exhumed from the body. It, the body, becomes slightly smaller, lungs no longer stretching. With slender fingers, she fixed her mother's hair while she lay there unmoved, still. It pervades, it conjures itself without permission. It incites fear and held tongues. When I look at that photograph, I see my grandmother as my mother, as myself. There is a truth. Each one before is a rehearsal for the next. And so I must prepare. And so I must work towards making the impermanent permanent with death masks made from icing and tears caught in lacrimatory bottles and stitches recording time. The crux of it all are those moments spent together making all previous efforts futile or so one would think. It produces an unyielding echo. Thank you. Okay. Serena, 
Mom? Yes, Natalie. <laughs> so I am Natalie Hopkinson. I teach at Howard University in Washington, DC. And I'm so happy to be here with my mom, Serena Hopkinson, who is Zooming from Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Would you like to start our letter? So we'll read two letters, one letter each that we've written to each other for as part of this book chapter on our own migrations um, between Guyana, Canada, and the United States. Would you like to start, Mom? No, you go ahead. <laughs> OK. So I'm going to read the letter called Daddy's Girl Part Two. Mom, we have this in common. We both spent the first decade of our lives in our birthplace before we made our first migration, when everything changed abruptly. For you, it was leaving the bush life on the Pomeroon River for the big city of Georgetown. For me, it was leaving Edmonton, Canada for a whole other country, Indiana in the United States. Growing up in Edmonton, most of my playmates were white Canadians, but a good number of kids were also the children of immigrants from different countries. China, Pakistan, Thailand, Yugoslavia, Czechoslovakia, Ukraine, Italy. I remember one solitary Jamaican, but no other blacks in our school. Canadian manners dictated that it was rude to comment on race. I started having questions as I approached puberty. In Etudes Sociales class, we talked about the white man who conquered and oppressed the First Nation indigenous Canadians. I wondered, where did I fit in? Didn't our family come here to inhabit their land too? We must be considered the white man. I was happy at this thought. At a sleepover, the girls went around a circle confessing their crushes. When I stopped at me, I shyly spit out the name of a white boy in our class. Everyone smiled politely, and then a silence hung two beats too long. Weeks later, I daydreamed, who would I marry? For the first time, I felt my difference, and it was a bit lonely. It helped to be part of a large family. The four of us were like a gang. Michael and Nicole, so smart, athletic, artistically talented and popular, blazed the path for me and Denise. But in 1986, in fourth grade, dad took a job in Indiana installing a new computer system for the Department of Motor Vehicles. Everything changed for our gang of six. I watched you cry as dad flew back and forth weekly from Edmonton to Indianapolis. Dad's absences also hit me hard. I often could not hold back my tears in school. I too was a daddy's girl. Of the four kids, I looked the most like him. I loved to snuggle underneath him. I was always sad when he commuted to his job in Indiana and I cried at school sometimes. A school counselor put together a calendar to count the days when he could be coming back home. Like anyone else, he had his flaws. He could occasionally be cruel and things only got worse when we moved to Indiana. Okay. My chapter will be on finding love and it will, um, it will be the precursor to what Natalie is talking about in Edmonton. Natalie. I am so proud of what you have done as an academic. It is maybe what I would have done if I were born at a different time when the options and expectations for women were different. In 1965, I managed to finish high school at the top of my class and St. Joseph's offered to extend my scholarship to do advanced level subjects for the next two years. By 1967, I had graduated from St. Joseph High School and found my first job at the Georgetown accounting firm as an audit clerk. A year later, I moved to Barclays Bank. At that time, the banks only hired Portuguese or high colored people, meaning light skinned. With my curly hair and my rich brown skin, I became the first black teller there. Around that time, I had met your dad, Terence Hopkinson, 
graduated from the top high school for boys, Queens College. He was tall and good looking with a mischievous dimple in his chin. It was 1969 and he was just back from traveling overseas working for IBM in Trinidad and Barbados and in Texas and New York. He was the best player on the badminton courts. I was one of three girls who played and I was an in your face kind of player. We played as doubles partners until we won the national mixed doubles championship the next year and represented Guyana in tournaments abroad. We did not have a ring winning record, but we did win at our relationship. We got married in 1970. Terence wanted to go to Canada to continue school. He had made a lot of connections working for IBM, maintaining computers throughout the Caribbean and training in the US. But he knew he could not advance any further at IBM if he did not get his college degree. He did not like what he was hearing about the draft to fight in Vietnam in the US, so we chose to move to Canada. I had no money, he had some. Neither our families had money to help. I approached my bank manager and asked to borrow $3,600. I had no collateral, but I assured him I would pay it back. He wrote me the check on my word. We left Guyana in 1970 and paid back the loan four years later. After our airfare and other expenses, Terry and I landed in Toronto with $108. Immigration asked us how long we wanted to stay. We said we would be going to the University of Toronto. They gave us 90 days to get our student visas. We went to the university, found out about the high fees and realized that going to university was not going to happen that year. Instead, we petitioned the Canadian government for landed immigrant status to allow us to stay and work. Between your dad and me, we had no doubt that all of it was going to turn out as we planned. He had the ideas and the suggestions and I worked on making them happen. Immigration officers asked whether we had any family or friends out West. We said yes. And we used our last dollars for airfare to Edmonton. We got our Canadian resident status within three months. I eventually got a job with the Alberta government. Your dad finished his bachelor's degree in computer science at the University of Alberta, then went on to do his MBA whilst working at major companies and owning his own business. During those years, we also sponsored my mother and three brothers to join us in Edmonton. I worked to support your dad's studies, went to college in the summers, and raised you four children. We became popular for our parties, and hangouts for club friends, college friends, and Caribbean friends. We acted in plays as a family. It was a good life in Edmonton. Thank you. Suchitra? Hi. So my name is Suchitra Matai, and um, I am going to first read from my chapter uh, in Grace's book. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the artwork uh, that I make. So I left Guyana in 1977 when I was three years old, but Guyana has never left me. Through family narratives, memories, and photographs, I have always been reminded of my homeland, yet simultaneously felt alienated from it. My family's migratory path from Guyana to Canada to the United States never led to a place of connection. I have always felt othered in so many ways. As a result, my life has been directed by a continual search for an imagined home. Making our journey first to Nova Scotia, Canada, and eventually to various areas of the United States, I patiently waited to find a place that felt right. In my 20s, I traveled to India, what I considered my original homeland. On my first flight there, I looked through the window as the plane landed in New Delhi and was overcome with an inexplicable familiarity. But as I traveled throughout India, unable to communicate with ease, I quickly realized 
that this was not the right place either. I would have to continue to look elsewhere. My family, who first came as indentured servants to British Guyana, is part of obviously a history of ocean voyages to foreign lands by means of contracts of bondage. And so as an artist, much of my art practice is driven by this idea of an invented, idealized homeland. My artwork is characterized by disconnected landscapes that are unreal, but offer a lingering familiarity. These landscapes are created from history, from memory, and from travel. Many of the objects I use in my practice, embroidery, uh, vintage needlepoints, macrame works, uh, jewelry boxes, found photographs, teacups, etc., are handmade, craft based, or domestic in nature. They are a nod to my Guyanese grandmothers, aunties, and mother who engaged in practices of embroidery, macrame, crochet, and sewing during my childhood. Thus, my work loosely weaves together a sense of an imagined home. Through each puncture of embroidery, each woven thread, and each painted stroke, I am both bounded by and freed from my past, present, and future homes. So I wanted to talk a little bit about um, first my time in Canada, and then a little bit about the artwork. So I came when I was, I went to Canada with my parents when I was young. So I spent all of my elementary years in Nova Scotia. And I have to say, uh, based on Grace's title of her book, uh, our book, The Liminal Spaces, it felt like a very liminal space. Uh, unlike Toronto, where there were communities of Caribbean people, there weren't really communities for, uh, in the place that we originally uh, ended up. So that place was uh, the Annapolis Valley. My, my father, um, was in graduate school there. And I could say it was a one street town, it was called Wolfville. And uh, it basically had a Sears Roebuck catalog store and no other real um, immigrants. And so other than a handful of graduate students, um, our friends were, um, you know, very few and far between. Yeah, after a couple of years, we moved to Halifax uh, where we did find a Caribbean community. And uh, I think we started to feel a little bit isolated. I mean, a little bit less isolated. When we first came to Nova Scotia, I wanted to say that there's a, in, in migration, there's so many levels of, you know, feeling displaced or disoriented. But I think um, the sensory experience, uh, a visual experience is what affected me the most. Um, so, the landscape being so different, the, you know, we came in fall and, you know, never seen the coloring of the trees, the snow, all of it. I think um, when I think of Canada, I think a lot of the about landscape, but of course, through my artwork, I also think a lot about landscape. So it makes sense. Um, starting with this image here, it's called indentured. And I, I mentioned that my grandmother, um, they sewed and they made things. Uh, my, my, one of my grandmothers was actually a professional seamstress. And so I learned a lot uh, about making things from her as well. And so it's really important to me now to include uh, and integrate uh, mm -hmm. aspects of what people consider crafts in my work. Mm -hmm. So in this work, uh, you know, when you move from place to place, there's a sense of, uh, you know, displacement um, and there's something very disorienting about that, right? Moving from, you know, like many of you, um, I, I wanted to convey that in some way. Uh, there is a sense of wholeness, but through fragmentation. And through my work, I try to convey that. Uh, so here there's escape, but it moves through other objects. Um, we can go to the next slide. I think a lot about colonialism and part of my project as an artist is taking apart, uh, dismantling uh, this you know, very singular sense of history that we get in the West. And so 
for me, I want to give voice to a lot of um, people who didn't have a voice before. And whether that be my, you know, my grandparents or um, other people from the Caribbean or India or, for, or from what, for other, from other places, there's an important aspect of my work uh, that takes this, this colonial history apart. And so in this uh, image, I use a very, um, uh, a needle pointed chair that has a very Baroque, very Western European uh, image on it. And then use the threads, the colors from the image uh, to start taking it apart. So we can go to the next one. And I also, of course, take away the function of the object. This is probably the most um, uh, interesting for me piece that I did a while back. It was, it's called Promised Land. And I think a lot about uh, you know, my great grandparents and my grandfather and crossing the Middle Passage um, as many of our ancestors, all of our ancestors did. And so I had the opportunity at one point to actually cross the Middle Passage myself. And I took a lot of video and sort of felt, I felt this um, connection to the Atlantic Ocean and the crossing of the passage. And so in this um, very European headboard, I projected um, the, a video of that Middle Passage. And it's very uneasy. The, the ocean was very rocky at the time. And it almost seems like you're in um, a vessel that is very small and shaky. And it, it to me mimics the experience of what it might have felt um, like looking through a portal. We can go to the next image. So in this image, um, I used Sanskrit texts uh, from India that I collected about, I, I got about 20 years ago. And they were sitting uh, in my mother's basement and I, I felt so uh, scared to use them because of their, um, you know, potency as like a, a, a ritual object or a religious um, page. And I, I ended up using them. I asked my mother what she thought. Should I use them? Should I not use them? And she said, well, of course, because through art, art has power. And sitting in my basement, they have no power. Uh, so I basically created this idea of home or a physicality of home through uh, the lens of history and, and kind of looked back to my past um, and to my present, because I, I grew up Hindu as well. Uh, and to think about home in those terms. So I think the in the last slide, I use a lot of materials that you know um, my family uh, would wear, so saris and whatnot. And here I use a very Western landscape to uh, disrupt it, and through the use of bindis. And I think that's my last image. Um, you know, I. I, I I mentioned my grandmothers because the book uh, is so rooted in women. Um, but I was thinking uh, lately that my grandfather told a lot of stories and there's a scholar called, uh, his name is Glissant, and he talks about oral histories and Creole culture. And I think that can be extended uh, to my family as well. But this idea of fragmented stories, I don't know if you, you have this in your family, but my grandfather would start a story, uh, move to another path, move to another path. There would all be all these uh, tangents, but then it would come back to a whole. And I think uh, that informs my work as well. I'll stop there. Close the presentations out with grace. Doing too many things. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Thank you all so much for being here, a whole 100 of you. That's so um, lovely to see you here supporting us and supporting this project. And just so you know, we're for this conversation with Elisa and Honor, we are focusing on the Guyanese Canadian narratives, but the book is this incredible, beautiful gathering of 15 women of Guyanese heritage who are based in Guyana and in the diaspora, including New York and London. And so unlike 
my friends here who have shared their beautiful stories and their art and their images so far. I have never lived in, in Canada. My, um, almost my entire extended family is there. My aunts, my uncles, my cousins, but my family actually um, migrated from Guyana to the United States. But Canada has actually occupied this sort of mythical place in my family's migration story, both a mythical place and in a lot of ways, um, and I'll share with you why, a kind of traumatic symbol in our migration story. So, and it starts with this, uh, this photograph. This is a photograph from the 1970s of my mother who is center in the, in the pink floral dress. And she is at a typical scene for so many of us, I'm sure in the Zoom room where we've gone to the Tamiri International Airport, as it was called then, to say goodbye to uh, family members. And so airports became these sites of transitions, you know, concluding an old life and starting uh, a new one. Five, so my mom is centered here, her grandmother is on the left and her older sister is the one leaving. She's in the back, <clears throat> right? She's on her way to Barbados. And so many of us know that, you know, in order to, to get to another place, there's sort of that in-between place. So my aunt first migrated to Barbados and then made her way to, to Canada. Um, a few years after this photograph was taken, um, my mother would, would lose her mother um, a few years after her father. So essentially the seven siblings were orphaned. And what happened really opened up this incredible, as Suchitra was just sharing with us, and that's the perfect word, this incredible fragmentation of a family. So essentially seven children are orphaned and the older sister that's in Canada decides that we, well, we've got to get you know, we've got to get the, the children out. And so she was able to get about three of the younger siblings to move to her with Canada. And the reason why it was only three is because the laws at the time, the migration laws at the time allowed sort of an emergency family sponsorship of the children that were under 16 to be able to get to Canada um, immediately to be taken care of by the older sis, uh, sibling. My mother was a few years older than, than that. And so because of that, she had to stay in Guyana and the siblings under 16 were the ones who got to leave. And so that began this incredible, um, such a catalytic moment for my family where so much of my mother's migration story begins with this relationship, building a relationship with her siblings in Canada who were able to leave Guyana and her having to stay in, in, in Guyana. And what I think Natalie Suchitra and um, Ms. Serena also shared with you all in terms of, of showing how their stories before they got to the United States started with Canada is that for so many of us that have left Guyana, there becomes this sort of triangulation between these three places. So our migration stories are actually Guyana, Canada, the United States. And so we're constantly in relationship and collaboration with the family that's in Canada, the family with, that's in Guyana, and the family that's here um, in the US. So to put on my editor hat for this project and my curatorial hat for this project to know my sort of personal feeling about Canada, that this is the thing that really was a very hurtful experience for my mother because Canada really ushered in this separation and fragmentation of her family. And it was a doubly traumatic event. So not only did she, was she just recently orphaned and lost her mother and her father, but now she's losing her siblings because of this urgency of migration. Um, so it was really so important for me to have this Guyanese-Canadian migration narrative present in the book 
and to see how Sandra and Erica and Natalie and Miss Serena and Suchitra really made that narrative such a prominent and important part of, of what the book is overall. So that's why we're here and we wanted to make sure that we dedicated a full event just to, to speak to the importance of, of Canada as a place, as a site um, to our migration stories. So thank you all. Thank you uh, so much, um, Erica and Serena and Natalie, Sandra and Grace. What we're going to do now is um, have a bit of a conversation with the contributors, Honor and I. We're sort of going to ask a few questions. We're going to ask a question so that each one of them can answer once. Um, and then we're going to open up the chat so that folks can participate. We're going to ask you to keep your mics off and just have the participants um, just have the the participants uh, speak because otherwise, if we put the mics on, we will never get out of here. And our aim is to get you out in about forty minutes. So if you can put your questions in the chat where everyone can see them, we may not be able to get to everything, but we will be recording, um, and we will select some questions once we open it up. I also wanted to just um, welcome a different book list, which is a Caribbean and African bookstore right here in Toronto is a community sponsor of the Caribbean uh, studies program at the University of Toronto. They're also home to People Centre, where if we did not have the pandemic, we would be right up there with Miguel and and Aita uh, having this event in their presence and in their space. So for those of you who are in Toronto and you want to get this book in your hands, it's an amazing book. It's a coffee table book. It's sitting behind Grace please show your love to um, a, a different book list and give them your online uh, business. So I, I guess I will um, open up and, and Honor and I are sort of, you know, taking this in, in, in turns. And so I guess I will open up with a, a, an opening comment or observation and then I, I, I'll put a question perhaps to begin to Sandra and, um, and Erica. In your opening, Grace, you, quote a line that Edward Danticat quotes from the Colombian American Patricia Engel's memoir, Paris, quote, the immigrant's life is art in its purest form. The immigrant's life is art in its purest form, end quote. And, and it, that really sort of speaks to me to the, the sense of imagination and desire, the, 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 the sadness and the melancholy that, that sort of is at the heart of this remarkable collection. This is really a beautiful moving collection that is a carefully curated act of love. And by moving, I mean both the kind of incessant restlessness that is part of the Caribbean and Guyanese spirit. You know, Guyanese is joke that anywhere you have to go that they don't have a visa, you will find Guyanese. Um, so moving in that sense, but moving also as tender and haunting in a way that sort of just strums you internally. And by love, I mean all of the ways that the contributors pay tribute through this aesthetic exploration of the experiences of the Guyanese women in their lives. In one instance here tonight, the love between Serena and Natalie. Love is also the best word I can find to language the work of the women who come to life in these pages, the ways in which they generate love and community out of these multi-stranded connections. And love manifests finally as a conversation both within the, the stories, across the stories, the, the rich resonances, you know, there are two of the stories that we read for tonight. They speak of fr fruits that are soaking the black cake as we approach Christmas um, and, and how significant that is. I believe Sandra actually has an exhibition in which the fruit soaking in cake in a jar is one of the installation pieces and, and it resonates outside of the text so that a, a Guyanese woman who is, I believe on the call tonight, is a doctoral student here at the University of Toronto, wrote to me this afternoon to tell me that she had written something for me last Christmas about her memories of Guyana that I ran in this diaspora column newspaper um, column that I've edited in Guyana um, for over a decade. And she wrote to me today to tell me that her grandmother who's 87 years old had recently passed away. And one of the things that the grandmother had left her were her cake pans. And I was teasing her because she went to make carrot cake 
And I said, your grandmother gonna haunt you because you can be taking the lady black cake pans and making carrot cake. So she was like, I was just testing it. But that, those resonances across those stories is beautiful. So I guess the question I want to ask to Sandra and Erica, having given that, that sort of my take on the book, um, I could say so much more, but the question I have for Sandra and Erica, Sachitra so used the word fragmentation and Sandra and Erica, I was really taken by the way in which you both talked about um, this fragmentation in relation to memory. So Sandra, you said, my head is full of fractured memories formed from the stories told to me. And in your case, Erica, you talked about what you remember is what your mother remembers. What she remembers is what I remember or the way you do things. And I wanted to ask you to reflect on what does it feel like as Guyanese Canadians growing up here who were not born, did not grow up in Guyana. I guess I'm asking this as a parent of two children who are in the same position as you. What does it feel like to relive someone else's experiences of another place via the stories they tell you of a place you have never visited or didn't visit or didn't live in or didn't visit for a long time? What does it feel to relive that experience of being Guyanese via the stories told to you of this place that grew up, you grew up um, in Canada hearing these stories of a place that existed as metaphor, as imagination, as story. So I wondered if you could talk about that perhaps in both of your cases, how you captured that in your artistic, in your artistic method, whether through the cake, Erica, or through the layering technique, Sandra, or anything else that you might want to share. Okay, I'll go first. First, you want to go ahead? Yeah. Um, so I, in my case, I've never, I've never had an opportunity to go to Guyana. So everything I know is um, from my mom's perspective, and it's all, you know, from when I was born. So like 1980 Guyana is what I know. I don't know anything of contemporary Guyana, and it is definitely a very um, fragmented experience but also there's like this strange kind of loneliness that occurs um, when I feel so connected to somewhere I've never been and set foot on um, but also growing up with these stories there's also this disconnect from being Canadian in a way um, trying to figure out how those stories mesh to kind of create my narrative. And so in the writing, for me, I think a lot of the fragmented um, kind of nature of how things feel for me come out in how the writing itself, the, the sentences are fragmented or shortened and very truncated. Uh, what about you, Sandra? Well, I was interested when uh, Alyssa was talking, was using that word haunting, right? Because I think the idea of haunting begins even before our families moved here because Guyana became a place that was not resembling what they grew up in. And so when they're here and they're telling us all these stories about back home, they're telling these stories of something that they miss. That's what I gather anyway, because they're not there anymore, they're here. And many people do not go back to live in Guyana and there's a reason for that. I also think that um, when Alyssa was also mentioning how art, something about art traveling, and uh, I find that a lot of Caribbean communities that happens with, you know, with Guyanese folks, you know, there'll be, I don't know, I did a project on, you know, basement parties. And so it's like they create these cultural spaces here to almost link with what they experienced back home. So through my practice and for the last few years, I've been working in photo-based gel transfers, as I say, because um, a lot of the photographs are photos of Guyana itself or old photographs that I, reprints and then I transfer them to other surfaces. In the process of that transfer, 
the, the, uh, the image wears down and becomes a little bit fractured. Sometimes the ink does not adhere to the surface and therefore there's like a change that seems to have occurred within that movement from one surface to another surface. So I'm kind of alluding to that change from, you know, that occurs when a person leaves one home to another home, as well as my thoughts of, or my memories of back home there. I know that my memories are not true memories. I remember when I went to Guyana and I wanted to go to particular streets, see particular buildings um, based on all the stories that I've been told. I, I knew that, you know, it was almost like these memories were my own, but I know that they were not. And it, so I know what I'm going to see is not going to be the true depiction of what I'm being told. And so what I'm trying to depict in a lot of my work is that, you know, what is a, what is a fractured memory, right? And how I can show that um, visually and how I can allow that idea to you know, the essence of that idea to come through the surface. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sandra. I'll, I'll turn it over to Honor. I mean, one of the interesting things on here, my mother's on this call from Guyana, for example, um, is that we actually have Guyanese from Guyana on this call joining us tonight, which I think is really quite remarkable. Honor? You're on mute. We're not hearing you. I unmuted myself and then it said the host muted me. So I don't know what that is. Anyway. You're good now. Okay, good. Um, so I missed it because I got bumped off the internet. So I didn't hear what Elisa asked. asked. So if I repeat the question, I, I'm sorry. You can just say, we answered that already. What's your next question? Um, the first thing I want to say is that I had to come off the video because I was bawling when Erica was reading because um, her part, her her piece about her mother, I found really very moving and um, it, it uh, brought up a lot of memories for me of my own mother dying. I, I won't say any more because I'll start to bawl again. So, um, but so thank you for that, Erica. Um, I wanted to ask a general question, perhaps of Grace, and then maybe other people could join in if they feel like it. Uh, so we're not so formally going, you know, left, right, left, right. Um, you know, uh, my generation uh, comes of age in the Caribbean around the time of independence. And we are born into a, a moment where our parents, um, many of them tell us about trying to get out of this sort of parochial and stifling um, racial and class anxiety of many of the families um, that they come from. And one of the paths out, of course, is migration. And for those of us who are born at that moment of, of independence, um, we're, we're sort of being taught to think in the opposite way, uh, to think of migration as a bad thing, to think of migration as a kind of betrayal and uh, as something wrong that we shouldn't do. Um, because if we do it in a way, we're taking with us all the cultural capital that the new nation has invested in us. And I wanted to ask you how, how you feel about that kind of narrative, because in many ways, your contributions are making another story, are making a different narrative about that. And I'm wondering if you might see the possibility of a kind of conversation between diaspora and and um, region between um, the transnational uh, children of that generation and the ones of, of, of my generation who remain behind. 
Well, first of all, Honor, that is um, an incredibly generous question, um, and I'm I'm really I'm really touched by it, and I'm really grateful that you asked it. And I'll tell you something that you may not like. There was a whole section in the introduction where I wrote about that. I wrote about that guilt. I wrote about you know the the intersection of this guilt and gratitude of of our generation and and being able to leave, but also you know reconciling and reckoning with um, what we've left behind. And I, I took it out, I took a big chunk out of it because it was raw and it was um, probably overly sentimental and, and uh, probably because I didn't have the courage to be that honest in print just yet. But it's something that every day that that narrative, that guilt, and you know, connected to so much gratitude about the life that I'm able to have because I left Guyana and what I left, that's something that I know I grapple with on a daily basis. And it's something I know a lot of us, not just Guyanese people, but so many of us who are, um, who have left a place for someplace else. Um, I know Serena's chapter and Serena and Natalie's chapter. I'm looking at Serena now, the way that Serena talks about growing up in the Pomeroon and all of, all of the work and all of the dreams and the vision she has to go back and to be helpful to this, this community, you know, those kinds of things. The reason I took it out, Honor, from the introduction and not made it public, because I don't have the answer yet. And I think so many of us that have left a place, whether it be Guyana or where else, um, are still struggling with what that answer is. How can we be good Canadian citizens, American citizens, you know, UK citizens, but still also remain good Guyanese citizens? I know for me, you know, it's it's little things like I try to be in Guyana at least once or twice a year. I try to support things like education initiatives for girls in Guyana, and that's a way probably of reconciling some of that, of that guilt. I do know for Guyana in particular, there has been a new re-energized uh, movement for those of us in the diaspora, in New York and London and Canada, where we're the strongest communities. To, do a, to come up with a concerted effort where we are making substantial contributions while we're away back to Guyana. So I know that's, that's become an official charge within the country and for those, um, that for those abroad. But Honor, I think what you're gesturing to is maybe that's volume two of Liminal Spaces, which I hope, I hope volume one has inspired other people to do volume two, three, four, five. Um, because just to say, Guyanese women speaking to and speaking about their experiences of migration is just one thing the Guyanese women are speaking about. There's so many other things that we are, we are elevating and that we're talking about and our contemporary moment of migration is just one of them. I have a question for Suchitra, but I wondered if perhaps Serena and Natalie, since you know Grace directly referenced your um, conversation as mother daughter in the diaspora, whether um, you wanted to reflect on that question. And one of the things that resonated with me, because part of my work, I, uh, I ended up looking at how Guyanese homes were actually produced by travel between New York and Toronto. I stumbled across these buses that predominantly working class Guyanese women who don't go back to the Caribbean or Guyana very often at all, but they travel from Toronto regularly. Some of them travel twice a month and they would go for weddings, they go to shop, they go for funerals, they go to find Sibyls in Queens. And, and I, it resonated when I think Natalie, in your exchange with your mom, y'all had gone to some event and you were at a restaurant in Queens. And I was like, I wonder if it's Sybils. And you were saying it, that's where your decision to start re to start thinking or exploring what it meant to be Guyanese came. It, it, it didn't come from going to Guyana. Guyana had arrived in New York. Like that was also, it, it's another way of thinking about the Guyana had also become 
Queens or Brooklyn. So I wondered if you and your mom can maybe reflect on that. I think it probably was Sybil's. You know, as I talk about talking to my uncle Ovid, um, we were at a, after a funeral and he just sounded so much, he was so, he had so much longing and in, in wanting to go back to Guyana and not feeling that comfortable in New York City. Um, and so I really was determined to go back. Uh, you know, my mom also took us back as children. We did a long trip in the early 80s, um, you know, which also allowed us to sort of see what Guyana was about. But this, your research is just in general is amazing. Um, but this thing about the, the houses is really fascinating because when I think about Guyanese culture, it isn't just rooted there. It is a global culture. We are represented from all of these places, from Africa to India to Portugal to all you know all these places that have been represented today. And so the culture that um, you know of Guyana is, is not South America. It's not just South American. It's not just Caribbean. It's all of those things. So I think. The migration that you're talking about is also within Guyana. It's it's there, um, and so it's a nice way to think about it in that house. Um, but I also thinking about it in the food, um, and you know all the different uh, influences that that sort of share our Guyanese palate. And I uh, would love to hear what my mom has to say to that. Serena. <laughs> um. That was a long question and a deep question. There's so much to say about it. I, I don't think in, in the early 80s when I was so longing to go back to Guyana um, because I missed everything about it and I had to go back. And um, Terence, your dad was in school and everything like that. He didn't want to miss his classes or doing stuff like that. But I had to go and I took my oldest son, Michael, anyhow. And I thought I would go for a whole month, right? Because the longing was so intense. But when I got there, I missed, I missed um, Terrence and I missed the apartment where I was living. I missed my friends and I missed everything. And then in Guyana, um, everybody again saw me as a foreigner. You know, once I left the Palm Rune, I was the girl away from school. And once I left Guyana, I was like a foreigner. So I never got really grounded again in Guyana. So most of it is really just a longing, just a longing about, um, about keeping the roots, the roots in Guyana, my family and different things like that. It's more, more of a longing. I don't know if it answers any, any question that was asked at all. Um, but that's what I say, it's, it's more of a longing than a reality. Um, I, I could not picture myself living in Guyana again, not be, because I love it, absolutely love it. But when I think of all my children and grandchildren and everything that it, it, we, we, even, even at my age, I'm still feeling disconnected, like, you know, like <laughs> your mind is in several places. No, thank you so much. The questions are now pouring in and Honor, I'm going to ask you to go through and maybe pick out and while you pick out, I do want to bring Suchitra in before we open up to questions. We, you know, and it seems like there's a lot of desire to hear from you folks. So we will extend this to let's say 745. We're going to ask folks to stay on and just stay with us. And while Honor is going through the questions, Suchitra, I wondered, you know, the title of this book is called Liminal Spaces. And I wanted to ask you to reflect through your work. What's so beautiful about your installations is how you center women's labor and the domestic space, which seems strange, right? Because it's a domestic story, but stretched out across all these transnational spaces. So you're also telling a story of what it means to not be the good Guyanese girl who stays in her place, who, who gets beaten, who, who obeys orders, right? You're charting these different kinds of stories. And I wondered if you could reflect on that for us as an Indo-Caribbean woman who comes to a country, Canada, where until 1996, you could not even be counted because in the Canadian census to be Caribbean, you had to be black. There was no space to mark that you were Indian and Caribbean. And then within a South Asian community, you were also not 
understood to be authentically South Asian because you had crossed the Kalapani. So I wonder if you could reflect on, on that and how your powerful art really tells us a, a different kind of story about what it means to chart and claim a space as Guyanese, as Caribbean, as Indian, as all of these, all of these things. Uh, that is a very, very good question. Um, you know, I think about, I'll start with the beginning. So you you did ask about the domestic practices and why I use those. And I feel as though by using them, I'm empowering women. I'm empowering the stories of makers of the past, but I'm also um, kind of giving a certain voice. I'm giving a voice to those makers, but I'm also giving a voice to um, you know, I, I think contemporary women, and that's what I hope, that's what I want. Um, you know, in terms of being all of these things, uh, you know, Car Guyanese, Caribbean, Indian, uh, American, Canadian, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's very complicated. And I think that, you know, we've been throwing around this word fractured, right? Um, and fragmented, and it feels, it feels very much um, as though there is no home, there's no one home, right? There, there's rather, um, there's multiple homes and they all, they all coexist. And I think through my art, um, I use a lot of mixed media and found objects and often they're very disparate. They don't seem to go together at all. Uh, and then I transform them and I allow them to occupy um, the same stage and they communicate with each other and it becomes an, almost a reconciliation of all these differences. And so through my art, um, I'm looking for that reconciliation. I'm looking to find um, you know, those resolutions which don't exist in one way or the other, but together as combinations and permutations, so. Thank you so much. I'm gonna turn it over to Honor now to um, maybe, begin to moderate. I will also feed her some of the questions, moderate the questions, and then we will close with Anna um, asking the final question and reflecting as a Jamaican woman, an artist living here in Canada, uh, reflecting on what this experience of hearing from these Guyanese women, um, what, what she has to offer and what she takes away. So Anna, and turn it over to you. Honor, Honor's been having some problems with her internet. While she's doing that, then um, I'm going to go. Oh, here it is. Here okay, I good. Okay, there you so go. Thank you. The, sorry about that. I'm having internet trouble, so I may be, I may disappear again. Um, my my question is uh, this question is from Cosmo, and it's a question for Erica, Sandra, and Suchitra. I hope I have massacred your name. Um, how has this book, how has your contribution to this book and um, your work in this book uh, impacted your identity as an artist and your work as an artist? I, I can speak to that for a minute. Um, I, I've said this before, but I think Working with Grace and everyone on this book um, has given me a sense of community in a, in a very different way than I had before. And I think that it, uh, it definitely affects, has affected my practice. Um, it's only of late that I've really thought about my work as a in a sense, uh, as, a, as a practice of reconciliation. And I think it's very much because of the book um, that maybe there isn't this, uh, perfect home. There isn't a sense of where you belong in you know one place, but rather um, there are multiple places that can coexist in your in your mind, your body, and 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 even you know physically. So going back, you know, to Guyana, going to India, going to these places, they're all part of who you are. And so, in terms of my practice, um, I I feel as though my language has stretched, my vocabulary has stretched. Thank you. Um, there's one more I wanted to raise. Um, and it picks up on a, bee, a beef I have with Alisa who named her dog after Bob Marley. 
Um, <laughs> so I have to ask this question, which is from, um, I think it's, let me just see, it's from Chris Clark. And they're asking, what is the role of music in navigating intergenerational memory, intergenerational trauma? And he hasn't uh, indicated who it's for, so anyone can jump in. This is not a sonic project, it's a visual project, but perhaps the visual also triggers the sonic. And um, I think it's an interesting question because whereas um, music from Jamaica and Trinidad has achieved you know, a kind of commercial presence mm -hmm. in popular culture, um, it's, not kind of, it's not so much the same for Guyana. So I'm just wondering what your thoughts might be on that. And, um, whether any of you have perhaps worked with the sonic um, elements of memory. So something interesting happened, I think it was today my or yesterday, my mom had sent me a link to an article about a song that she remembers singing as a child in Guyana. And she was sitting here in the living room. What's the song, mom? She'll tell me the name of the song in a minute. Um, Hello, she, where's mom? She's here. <laughs> she's she's doing this. No. <laughs> Born in the land. In the land of the mighty Roraima, land of great rivers and far stretching seas. So like the mountain. Okay. You got the picture. <laughs> what was lovely was um, sitting here in the living room and she was trying to recite the song. And as she's trying to recite the song, there are moments where she forgot certain lyrics mm. and then would kind of go within herself to try to remember and recall. Onward, and then, upward, Mary ever go. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and if you were school children, you'd sing, Mary had a goat day by day, she tied it with a rope. Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, yeah, and that came up. She would say, you know, but the kids would remember saying this. Yeah. And so I think like, day it's by day. day. Mm -hmm is um, with music that it, it, it can, um, like there's that, that power for it to heal, for it to um, allow memories to kind of recollect, like come back. Uh, it's just, I don't know, it's, it was an interesting moment. So that question just reminded me of, of this morning. Mm -hmm. And Sarah Mayor Morgan, who just turned on her, um, her microphone to sing is coming in from Australia and she left in the 1950s. So there, there is, we have another strand. Anyway, Honor, thank you. I think some, someone had also mentioned the, the basement parties and uh, you know, my mom and dad did huge parties in Canada and Edmonton that my mom mentioned in the, um, in the letter that she just read. And I don't know if you all have seen uh, Steve McQueen's Small Acts, the, the lover's rock was so amazing. I was watching with my uh, father-in-law who's from Jamaica and you know that's another diasporic thing that the Caribbean house parties and that was beautifully represented in that film. If you guys, I recommend it if you guys haven't seen it. I just want to add that um, I agree with you. I just saw small acts the other day and uh, especially that second episode, it is really noteworthy because it's like the entire episode is just a basement party and every all the shenanigans that happen in that basement party. And it uh, really takes you back, right? It's, and it's it was in London, but it could have been in Toronto. It could have exactly. been in Edmonton. It could have been in New York. It yeah. could have been anywhere. It was fun and important, I think. <laughs> Um, Alisa, do you want to pick up on any more questions? I have I have a few more that are here. I don't know if you had picked out any that you were particularly um, wanting to go. There, there's one here for, um, I'm going to ask it to Suchitra because Erica has said she's never, um, she hasn't had the opportunity to re go to Guyana's yet. This is from Nish Patel asking, um, Suchitra, have you had the opportunity to exhibit your work in either Guyana or India? Uh, not yet. No, I would welcome that. <laughs> that would be very make me very happy. But no, I have not. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so there's another question here, which is um, which is from Zabadia. I hope I've got the pronunciation correct. And um, she's asking whether any of the contributors um, have considered including the image of a barrel or a suitcase or a, or a grip in their representation of migration and movement. So that's one question and I'll I'll give you the option of another one. Um, it is, why do Guyanese um, people associate being Guyanese with, with movement? Um, why is that a specific quality of Guyanese identity? Well, to the barrel question, um, there's a beautiful chapter in the book by Ingrid Griffith called When They Left Us. And I, I think it's one of the more powerful pieces in the book because she speaks to what happens when um, Guyanese parents leave their children in Guyana. And so they are the barrel children, um, as, mm -hmm. as we colloquially call them. And it gives us that perspective of what it means to, as children, to be left and how that act by parents really traumatizes and fragments the family. And so I'll put that in the chat for you so that um, you can, can read the chapter. And that's not, I really, it was really important to have that child's perspective in the book because you all are seeing so much of this book is not about politics. It's not about migration policy. It's about families. It's very intimate and it's very, very much about what is happening just within our families as a reflection of the politics and the policy. And so Ingrid Griffith's chapter really shows us the perspective, a very emotional perspective of how children feel, so many children feel when their parents, whether by choice or um, by by trauma, have to leave and leave their children behind. Mm -hmm. There was a. Um, I've also just put a little link in there. There's a beautiful um, short film from Barbados that I teach in my classes here at the University of Toronto called Barrel Stories about a young child who lives with her aunt. And that brings me to this comment from. I'm going to just read it and see if anyone wants to reflect on it from Pamela Grant. As a seven-year-old child, quote, extracted against my will from Guyana, I remember wanting to return and demanding that of my parents. To be honest, my mom remains the one who resists returning to Guyana. My dad never really settled here in Canada or England. I, I can testify to that because her father taught me at York University and he taught a course on Caribbean integration and taught within the Caribbean Studies program. So he he created an intellectual and social community for generations of Caribbean people here in Canada. Um, and so I wanted to pay tribute to Percy Anderson tonight too. As a 49 year old, Pamela says, I took the initiative to go back to live and volunteer in Guyana at home. I've made the difficult choice since then to just go back on my own and spend as much time as I can. I just got back from nine months at home and I hope to be able to retire home so it's interesting, Pamela keeps saying home and means Guyana. That driving desire has not shifted. It has just intensified. At 64 years old, having spent 53 years here in Canada, I have never felt at home here and continue to long to just be home in Guyana. I wondered if um, anyone wanted to reflect on that. And, and, and I'm actually going to ask Anna to be one of the persons who reflects on what that generates for her as, um, as someone living here and who I think has a similar kind of restlessness. Well, I, one, I think that the different generations have different responses to it. So that's why this is interesting to me. So, um, you know, how you relate to, to where, to that sense of leaving has to do with um, many things. Uh, I think it has to do with unresolved difficulties that you might have had there that you can't resolve because they're larger than you. They're social and political difficulties. You would have loved, I mean, any one of us would have loved them to be resolved. We may not have the same idea of how we would like them resolved, but we would certainly like them resolved. And the fact that we are there, we are no longer there means that 
we won't be able to see those things resolved on the spot. So you may make something productive of it in another life, in this other life, but it's not, it's, there will always be, and there's a quote that Stuart Hall, that Stuart Hall, a, a couple of lines from Stuart Hall that sums it up for me. And he's talking about Miles Davis, the, the jazz musician. And he's saying, you know, when he hears Miles Davis trumpet, it just triggers something in him. And what he says is it triggers um, the regret for a loss of a life which I might have had, but didn't. And the restlessness and the nostalgia for what cannot be. And I think that that can be a utopian, that can give you a push, that can give you that, that nostalgia, that sense of loss, that sense of restlessness is something that can push you to act. It can be productive. It doesn't mean that you won't always feel that pain or you won't always feel that terrible sense of loss. But I think that that restlessness can um, trigger a kind of response of if, if, if I could, this is what I would rescue. This is what I would, I would want to have. Do you see what I'm trying to say? Is that making sense? And I think, um, I think that's what y'all are doing in a sense that y'all are trying to see, trying to respond to this, you know, if I could remake the memory, if I could make use of that memory, if I could, if I could redefine family, if I could have family transnationally, if transnational family was a thing, if narrow nationalism hadn't failed, if, you know, if, if all those things had happened, this is what it would be. This is what I want to rescue from it. And these are the textures, these are the images, these are the ideas um, of, what, of what it might be or where we might start together to do something. That's beautiful. Did anyone else want to reflect on 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 Pamela's thoughts or comments? Tivia, um, who's a doctor? Oh, yes. Go ahead, please. I think one of the the the, the things that I'm I'm not hearing. I I, I see. I hear from Grace and, and the others a, a sense of not being able to do just what I did, like Nike, it, just go <laughs> and enjoy those new memories. So the first time I returned, I the memories that I had, both those from the photographs and what my parents and aunts and uncles and so on would tell me um, were there. But you know, when you when you try to go back to Murray Street where your husband grew up or where you used to go before and it's now Kwamina, that's a memory that quickly changes when you understand why it's now Kwamina, not Murray Street um, and, and all those other things where there are the changes that are there, but they're not bad things. I mean, I haven't experienced difficulty in going back and seeing that the memory that I might've had as, as a, at age eight is now something that is is a, fa a facade or a facility that's not there or or a place that's not there or an experience that can't happen because you know because the bandstand isn't there by the seawall anymore um, <laughs> those are all things that you then make new memories because what's there now is great like they're wonderful new memories that could be made that i have been able to have my children enjoy because they've been back or been to um, and they make their own memories. And I think the, the element of being able to talk about making new memories and, 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 and mixing that old, the nostalgia with, with the new and, and the vibrancy that's there in Guyana and, you know, the wonder. I mean, there's all the bad stuff. We, you know, everywhere has bad stuff. But mm -hmm. we can make positive memories and there are positive things and mm -hmm. more positive than negative, I think. Um, and I, and I think that's mm -hmm. something I've been able to convey to my children who weren't born in Guyana. But if you ask them, they're born here. They tell you right. at 30 and 25, they say, 
they're Guyanese. Yeah, thank <laughs> you. I, and I think that's certainly something that um, uh, Sandra in particular and Serena and Natalie actually um, explicitly generate and cultivate Natalie and Serena in the back and forth and then talking about, you know, going to Guyana, Natalie and traveling that Pomeroo in the way that Sandra talks about the Essequibo. So I think that's actually there and, and, and we see that um, generated there. There's a, another comment here from Tivia. We're just probably going to take one or two more questions. There's a comment here from Tivia, who's a doctoral student in the, the um, Institute of Gender and Development Studies, working with doc, Dr. Gabrielle Hussain in Trinidad and Tobago. And Tivia looks, um, her work is actually looking at Guyanese migrant women in Trinidad. You know, like 80% of Guyanese uh, migrate extra regionally, but there are significant levels of intra regional movement. And, and so her work is focusing on Guyanese women in Trinidad. And she talks about the significance of documenting personal narratives and the way in which that helped these women to bring insights into their everyday experiences as migrants and products of migrant families. And the question she has for everyone. And so maybe I'll ask this question and then invite Honor to close out with a final comment or question. So I'll ask everyone to reflect on it. How has this project changed you? Two minutes each. How has this project changed you? So who wants to go first of the country or contributors? I, I like nobody can talk now. <laughs> I can talk. I'll, I'll say okay. that. Um, can I join him? Yeah, um, yes, this is my mom. Mom, you can join in um, briefly because we do want the contributors to ask answer this question, but go ahead, please. No, I just want to make an observation. It's been very interesting, this whole dialogue. Um, I had an interesting experience last week with my granddaughter, Alisa's daughter. Alisa doesn't even know this happened. We were talking, and I said to her, how do you feel? Are you Canadian or are you American? She was born in the state. Are you Canadian? Or are you American? Said, oh, no, 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 no. I said, then what are you? And she said, I'm Guyanese. I said, what do you know about Guyana? If I read all about it, that's what I know. Would you like to comment on that? That is somebody, a child who was born of, yes, a Guyanese mother and a Guyanese father, but who only came to Guyana about three times in her life. But she obviously, does not identify with the Canadian experience and her, 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 her she hankers for a gallon that she doesn't even know. Would you like to comment somebody, Anna, for example? You know, Alisa, you know, um, Kai. This is Kai. I, I, well, let's open it out to the panel, right? That's my cop out for the evening. Um, let's open it out. Is that is that is at the heart of a lot of this the 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 work? But they, the I think each of the contributors has made something of that that conflict. I can comment on that. Let me let me comment on that. So when I was young, you know, going to school, I, you know, from what we were talking, what I was talking about previously, you know, all the stories that I've been told from my parents, my family about back home in Guyana. I always felt that I was missing out on something that was of substance being here in Canada. And so I was always, I always told people I was Guyanese. And I had another friend who was also Guyanese but I was also born here when we were kids, this is elementary school. We would always tell people that we were Guyanese and it was mainly because we just thought it was more interesting <laughs> than just being <laughs> Canadian. <laughs> So we, we always felt like there was like this connection with back then, you know, back there. So I, and then I'm going to answer also the, the question that was asked by, you know, the audience member. So as time goes on, and then I developed this art career of sorts, and a lot of the work that I focus on is about you know, the you know, Caribbean folks in Toronto and, uh, you know, concerns around identity and belonging and home and such. And then it morphs into this idea that is more personal around me as being a first Canadian generation of 
Guyanese specifically parents. I, I realized that a lot of those feelings that I had when I was young is now really embedded in who I am. And I'm so happy for it. It also gives me like this focus in a way and a more confidence in how I create what I create. I'm uh, driven in that kind of way. And so when I was invited to do, to contribute to the book, I was like, okay, that's great. Because now it's like, I, what I was doing in this aspect of my practice, because this is just a part of my practice, it has kind of succeeded when it comes to this discussion around uh, being a first Canadian um, person of Guyanese descent. It's like a lot, some of what I'm talking about is resonated, resonating out of the practice. And it's also interesting to hear from the other artists who are also included in the book and to read their words. And, um, you know, Erica has been a person that's always been present uh, in the city for me as another uh, person of Guyanese descent who has a certain aspect of her practice, I believe as well, that can concentrate on this, although her, her, her practice is also vast. So, you know, I think that's my answer. <laughs> that's beautiful. I think intergenerationally, Serena wants to weigh in here. Okay. Serena? Oh, I have a comment um, on the, the children of the um, Guyanese that left, the, the new Canadians or the new Americans and everything like that. I was so excited when Natalie on her own was just so intrigued by my brother's longing to go back. But after a lot of research and one of the books that she wrote, she shared with me, Natalie shared with me, she says, mom, I understand you and daddy better. I know, I know you guys better just because I've learned about Diana, learned about all of the different uh, races and cultures and things like that. And I understand myself better too. And I said, well, after you learned about all of the different um, races in Guyana and things like that, what is your final, what is your final conclusion? And she says, you're all confused. <laughs> <laughs> and I kind of understood what she meant because it, it, probably, um, it probably refers to a lot of different Caribbean people where all of you know, my mom is, is, is Aborigine, my dad is black, you know, we've got the white people and you've got the, the Portuguese and you've got everybody all in us with all different cultures, different foods, different everything like that. And so, all, you know, all of those different things that are, that are part of our lives makes us really complex people. And I think that's what she was getting at. And to understand us better, it was good that she did research herself mm -hmm. and understood that herself. That was. So I have a, a question from Rama, Rama by Espinay. Um, and it goes like this. Are you in touch with artistic communities, scholars or activists in Guyana? I mean, beyond family connections and integrated with your various practices? How might such dialogues be facilitated? And can you speak to how such connections might enrich your practices? So I guess that's a question both for the editor and for the artists. What happens when we put here in conversation with there and what happens if we, if we think about how such connections might be mm -hmm. And Sandra can certainly speak to this with Alice Yard in Trinidad. Um, the answer is yes, uh, because that's absolutely necessary and critical. And a, a large part of my curatorial practice is um, working with artists based in Guyana, particularly because they don't have the, um, the opportunities to exhibit their work and to have a thriving practice because Guyana is still very much um, in a lot of ways struggling to create those resources, incredible artists in Guyana and scholars, but they don't have the kind of support 
um, and network that they need. So a large part of my work as a curator over the last few years has been to bring those their projects and their work to American audiences and to American art institutions. Um, I do want to make it clear, though, that this book has Guyanese women living and working in Guyana um, in it. Um, we're just focused on the Toronto part of the book, but Khadija Ben, Dominique Hunter are two incredible artists that have wonderful chapters in this book. So um, I recommend that you take a look at that too. I also would just say I, from my last book project, Grace actually connected me with, um, you know, a really important artist in Guyana, um, Bernadette Prasad. Um, who mm -hmm. I got to know and spent a lot of wonderful time with. So I'm still in contact with her um, and, you know, many uh, people in Guyana. And then my, I have to say that my cousin, Carlos Ben, just poked his head. He asked a question and I made him turn on his, turn cam on his camera. Can you wave, Carlos? He's from Guyana. So, um, you know, we still have so much family that's down there as well. And uh, so we try to stay connected um, in that way, and it's a it's a privilege to stay connected. And uh, what I want to add to what my mom says is, I do think that it yes, we are such complex people, you know, like our stories are so fragmented, and all the the restlessness and the moving, you know, we we hold a lot of cultures, a lot of languages, a lot of taste, a lot of flavor, and being a part of this project really helps me feel rooted. You know, because I am restless. Like I want to move, I want to travel, I want to go, I want to learn, I want to explore. But you know, being a part of this project like that makes you understand that you're connected to something, and there's a ground that you're rooted in, um, and that gives you a lot of confidence to walk through the work, through the world, understanding your history, understanding who you are, and it's most amazing to have those stories centered around women. I just think it's just so powerful. We are the holders of the culture. We are the ones who pass it down to generation, whether it's the food, you know, through our conversations, through, you know, um, and so it just makes this whole collection just really special. And I feel so privileged to, to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. Alisa, um, I wanted to ask you to remind people how they can order the book. Um, well, Grace, do you want to? Yes, um, I'll put the link again in the chat. We've been putting it throughout, and uh, just to let folks know that we um, uh, we got a grant to make sure that the online versions of the book, the PDF and the HTML versions, are free. So as long as you have a phone and or a computer and the internet, you can read it online, completely freely accessible. And in the link that I'll put in the chat as well, if you want to purchase a print copy. You and are for those of you in Toronto too, I'm putting the link to a different book list, which is a Caribbean and African bookstore. And also the People's Residence, they host an incredible series of ongoing conversations and they, um, they, uh, Folks who run that, Aita Sadu and and um, and uh, Miguel, um, actually have taken some of those conversations online. So please give them your love and give them your business. They will get the book in for you if you're in Toronto or in the GTA. Um, they will. They will. They. They. I. You want. You want to suggest that you um, order the book through them. It's. It's a remarkable. Um, remarkable collection and worth having. So honor. <laughs> Thank you, Elisa. Any final words? <laughs> well, we can <laughs> help, right? Because this can be a call and response. So, um, well, Thank you guys very much for everything that you said. One of the wonderful things about tonight was it didn't feel like one of those rarefied academic discussions that, you know, um, you have and then, you know, at the university and then you go home and uh, cook your dinner and it doesn't seem to have any relationship to um, what you're having uh, to do um, outside of the screen of academic debate. So it felt really grounded. Um, I think one of the things that for me I'm taking away is that um, this, this tension, this back and forth and this, you know, um, contrapuntal kind of 
dialogue between here and there, between um, there and there, because there is not one place, there is many places. I mean, Ghana's huge and has so much difference within it. Um, is an ongoing process. And that one of the things that this book does is help us to recognize that there are many, uh, that just identifying the conflicting um, moments that we must negotiate and just, uh, you know, recognizing some of the very different parts of what we feel and how we feel can be really important um, in terms of remaking memory but also um, re-envisioning a future and I think that's very important and for me in in it's summed up in a picture of Sandra's that I wrote very briefly about once and it's this picture where she shows this young man I think he's wearing a t-shirt and he, he he's he's turning his head and the camera catches him and his face is a blur a kind of blur mm -hmm. but and I used to read that blur uh, in terms of a loss a kind of loss of identity but you know thanks to the work that you're doing I think I would reread that picture as um, as kind of asserting an identity, asserting an identity which contains the conflicts that are productive in the process and project of movement. So thanks very much. I hope we can continue this kind of dialogue going forward. Alisa, what are your yeah. reflections? Um, nothing much to add to what you said. I think what you said is absolutely beautiful and I think indeed what it means to live in the hyphen, to live in between these spaces, to, to redefine and generate home in a multitude of ways. I think one of the things that's really beautiful is the fact that several chapters in the, 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 the several chapters in the book pay attention to those who never left, right? Or as we saw in the case of Pamela Grant or the folks on the call who are coming in from Guyana, whose lives still are touched deeply um, whether it's Carlos and his family outside of Guyana, lives are touched deeply by these practices of transnational migration. And for those of us who are out here, years ago, I interviewed a Trinidadian woman and I asked her where home was and she paused and then told me a story of a recurring dream that when she wakes up, she said, I dream in more than one place. You know, like if you're multilingual, which language do you dream in? She said, I dream in more than one geography. She said, I dream in more than one place. And sometimes when I wake up, I don't know which country I'm in, whether I'm in Trinidad or whether I'm in Toronto. And, you know, I think that, that, that that's what I take from this book, that your artistic and aesthetic sort of exploration allows us to hover and live in the imagination. I want to thank you for that, because I think the imagination is where we learn how to be human um, with each other and with our surroundings as we close this out and remind ourselves for us in Toronto of whose lands we're on and ask all of you around the world who are in on this call, including those of you in Guyana and in relation to our Indigenous First Peoples who are paid tribute to in Serena's story of a mother who was um, Ar um, Amerindian, um, that we think about how this artistic um, gift that Grace has so beautifully curated um, allows us to stay with those relations. And as a Guyanese, I just want to say that at a time when our country has just come out of a really fraught moment where we're still in a moment of vituperative back and forth um, politics, to just have an evening tonight with you women and all of the other folks and men and everyone else who's on this call speaking about home and experience and loss offers up a different model of what it means to be in dialogue to listen with each other, whether we agree or not, but to model a different kind of way in which, and to me, that is what it means to be Guyanese, the best of who we can be, or as the poet Martin Carter says, a free community of valid persons. And so I want to thank you all tonight for, for being here and for staying. It's 66 people left and it's eight o'clock, y'all, they won't get off this call. Um, but we are going to have to say, um, goodbye and, and, and thank all of our presenters and we're going to give the final word to Grace and Nisa Ali for really spearheading this magnificent project.
Well, you had the perfect uh, parting words, Alyssa, in honor. And just on behalf of Sutra, Erica, Miss Serena, Natalie, I think Natalie fell off. Um, and uh, Sandra, thank you for treating our book with such beautiful care. We're getting serenaded up. Uh, beautiful care and thoughtfulness. And I want to circle back, Alyssa, you started this conversation talking about love and you captured it perfectly. This project is a, is, is a love project. It's a gift to our mothers and our grandmothers. The book itself is dedicated to all of our mothers and grandmothers. And it means so much to us that everyone that's reading it and interacting with it sees the love coming out of it and the love we have for this place that birthed us and for the people that shaped our lives. So thank you all. Thank you both, Honor and Alyssa. Thank you, the 65 oh, people wonderful. left for, <laughs> for, um, for staying so with us. Mom, you know. yeah. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Take Good care. Night. Bye -bye. Good night. Good night. Oh. <laughs> Born in the land of the mighty. Oh, the mighty oh, wow. land <laughs> of <laughs> Yes, <laughs> great Good night, Bar Sarah. <laughs> Good night, Good night, Sarah. <laughs> no, Bye -bye, like the mountains, the sea, and the river. Great, wide, and deep in our lives would be deep. Poor Diana had a second. I can't even remember how. <laughs> I'll sing you the chorus and then I'll go. It's onward, upward, may we ever go. Day by day, strength and beauty grow. Or if you were Guyanese, it would be Mary had a go today. Till at length the goat bust the rope and Mary had to run behind him. That's the actual better version. On that note, on that note, goodbye. Thank you for joining us from Australia, Sarah, and everyone from all around. The world. Good night. Nice to see you, Lisa. Bye bye. Yeah, bye, bye, bye bye. Yeah, God. It's driven this. Yeah. Uh.